As we move through human history, there is this one constant. The kingdom of darkness opposes the kingdom of God. There are keys to understanding this as these two great themes of scripture advance in the earth. Welcome to Current Affairs with Sam Solon. Now, previously in our studies, we've seen uh, the seven uh, trumpets, we've seen the seven plagues, uh, and so on. But now we are looking at the seven bowls of the wrath of God, finalizing the judgments upon the wicked in the earth. As I have said, it is inevitable that that which was begun should be concluded. Whether it is what God began or what Satan began. And there is an an inevitability to the judgments of both. We know we know absolutely that there were certain designated outcomes that would inevitably occur in the end because of how they were set up in the beginning. For example, I've mentioned this before, the theme of the conflict in the world all had to do with the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And God said, I'm going to put enmity between, speaking to the serpent, He said, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman. Enmity would be a continual state of war between the two until until the end, when things are summarized. Now, one of the patterns of behavior of the, of the enemy, and one might say perhaps the underlying pattern of behavior, is to try to present himself as God and try to present the truth or try to present a lie as the truth. Therefore, Deception will be at an all-time high at the end of the age because that which has been presented to be of God, although it's deceptive, will reach the, the apogee of its arc and would, would have to be judged. Otherwise, all mankind at some point would be deceived. Now, on a parallel path is that path of the saints. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to continue to connect the Spirit of man to the Spirit of God so that we might know the mind of God. And in that corporate man, the body of Christ, God would reveal Himself as thoroughly distinct from the manner in which the seed of the serpent would reveal itself until the two, like tares and wheat, had reached the end of the growing cycle and had borne fruit and now the fruit can be judged. In both cases, the fruit is human being, the fruit is, consists of human beings who evince the character of God on the one hand and the character of the evil one on the other hand. And both have a summary and summarizing context in which the fullness of this spirit inculcated in them is put on display. So the Spirit of God has produced the likeness of divine character in the sons of God and they are 
the glorified saints who, like those who had been before them on the earth, sing the song of Moses and of Christ. And those who are of the evil one, their system has nothing to rejoice about. It's reached its apogee, it's crushed and devoured the whole earth and trampled it down. And now, now, and including waging, waging war against the saints, and now God must deal with it. These are not symbolic or metaphorical references. These are the, these are the plain meaning of Scripture, a time of reckoning, a time of judgment. That is what is now being played out finally in its final conclusions, generally in the book of Revelation and now specifically in Revelation 16. So out of the naos of God, out of the temple come seven angels full uh, who have bowls, seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. There, this would suggest that the angelic beings, the invisible beings, charged with bringing divine judgment and divine destruction upon the beast, upon Satan and his, his, uh, uh, his concoction to which he gave his power, his throne and great authority, that angels are bringing this but they're coming out of the temple of God. And the word for temple there is of course the word naos. They come out of, from amongst the people of God. So angels do the bidding of the saints. That's the point. Angels do the bidding of the saints and God commits these final judgments into the hands of the saints. Just like he said that God has entrusted all judgment into the hands of Christ who by His Spirit delegates these judgments to the body of Christ. So the, the, the angels who come, whether they be uh, spirit beings or the body of Christ, they're acting in consort with, uh, with the mind of Christ. That's why they come out of the naos of God. So for anyone who might lose heart reading about these things as they come forth on the earth in their appointed times, look at how thoroughly in control of events the saints are. That's why the body of Christ in heaven and the body of Christ on earth being linked to the same head by the same Spirit are in perfect consort, they're in perfect agreement. And rather than us being on the earth, rather than us being terrified by the events that, that represent the final destructions of the lie built out to its fullness by the Cosmocrator, the God of this world, empowered by Satan, who is one and the same, um, as this happens, the saints, as this judgment comes upon all of that that has opposed the saints and boastfully presented itself as an alternative to the kingdom of God, the saints are intimately involved in these procedures of judgment. And whether we are speaking of actual angelic beings carrying these bowls of the wrath of God or decrees spoken on the earth by the sons of God on the earth. The point is there's absolute coordination between the body of Christ and these angels who minister the destruction 
of the systems of the cosmos. Prior to that was the Song of Moses and the Lamb, which is to speak in advance of the righteousness of God, that God is altogether righteous, even though His judgments are horrifying. We will see a similar uh, uh, song to the one spoken in chapter 15 in chapter 16, and there's absolute symmetry in terms of content and and intent between the two songs. Uh, Just one other comment before we leave chapter 15 and get into chapter 16. The temple was filled with smoke for the glo- uh, from the glory of God and from His power. That's like what happened when the temple of Solomon was built and dedicated. Smoke there is an indication that man, that the priests in that temple, on in the Levitical order, could not function by sight. They had to function in a form by the leading of the Spirit. It would indicate that this smoke is more in the nature of a cloud that accommodates the presence of God than it is a blinding um, um, construction or configuration meant to blind. In this smoke there is the presence of God and that's what it's saying. The temple was filled with smoke from, from the glory of God and from His power. The smoke was a result of the showing of the glory of God and the power of God. So this is the point, whoever is functioning out of the Spirit of God has nothing, is, loses nothing by being in smoke that is the glory of God. In fact, it is this that separates from those who act according to the flesh and those who act according to the Spirit. Even if you cannot see God is the point, you're still able to function fully and effectively if the glory of God is the cloud or if the glory of God is the smoke that obscures from the unbelieving and informs the believing. So the glory of God and His power, and no one was able to enter the the temple till the seven angels had completed their work, which is to say there is a sealing in the sense of being sealed because the earth has been reaped can come in to the temple now. It's the end of the days of salvation upon the earth. Terrible, a terrible thing, a great and terrible thing. Now, then I heard a loud voice from the temple, chapter 16 verse 1, saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Again my point, the instruction to the angels is given from the location commonly uh, that entertains the body of Christ. From where the body of Christ is, that's where the command to the angels to rain this destruction upon the earth comes. So rather than us Uh, needing to get out of here, get out of the earth, and rather than us being terrified by the events at the end of the age, we've been given the authority to levy these judgments and the angels are willing, the angels as ministering servants are the willing, uh, uh, the willing, uh, they comply willingly with our our commands to them, or at least the commands of the body of Christ in heaven uh, to them. 
there being no disconnect between the body of Christ in heaven and on earth, one may be assured of the peace and well-being of the people of God while they're still on the earth in these times. So, and I emphasize this to point out that there is no need for angst or worry. These things are told to us basically to let us know what's going to happen, not at all to terrify us, and we should not be terrified. So then the final judgments are poured out. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl upon the earth. Foul and loathsome sore came upon men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Now, in this fashion, the fashion of this of these decrees, we're observing that there is a similarity between the judgments that are being poured out now and the judgments of God upon Pharaoh in Egypt. There, of course, there were ten plagues, and in, in kind they were somewhat dissimilar uh, to these seven uh, judgments of God. But, but their similarities are it's a time for the wicked to face the consequences of their wickedness in the destruction of their works and in the destruction of their environments. The first is said, a foul and loathsome sore came upon men who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Once again, what is the mark of the beast? You know, we've heard this thing rendered as vaccines, we've heard it rendered as the implanting of chips, and uh, we've heard that it's the batteries that power, the micro batteries that power, or micro cells that power the, um, the chips that contain the mark of the beast and that they're bursting because the environment um, has become unstable and the rest of it, and that they have sores on their foreheads and on their... That is... Whoever thinks like that is imbecilic. No, it's not that. It doesn't have a thing to do with any of that. Because the mark of the beast is simply those who rely upon their own abilities uh, and the sweat of their brow, they are dwellers in the sixth, in the economy of the sixth day, and their economy has come undone. So, the reference to loathsome sores coming upon men who have the mark of the beast, it's more like their logic, their reason, is like a stench. Now, to each other, they've become desperate, and to each other, they are looking everywhere for answers, going here and there. They have heaped to themselves teachers for whatever they lust for, and it's all come apart. Let me give an analogy to the stench that I think is being referenced here. In recent times, not very long ago, in some instances less than a year ago, well actually less than a year ago, um, thousands of prophets prophesied falsely that the then President Trump would be re-elected. 
He was not. There was a stench upon the prophetic, like a running sore, like a marred, a marred visage. That's the idea. You compare, you compare the luminescence of the saints just one chapter over to this. Let me, let me remind you. Concerning the saints, he said, I saw something like a sea of glass, this is verse 2 of chapter 15, mingled with fire, and those who had the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the name or the number of his name, and they were standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. There's glory in that, there's light in that, there's delight in that. Right? And they're singing the song of God's justice. Compare that to this. So the first angel poured out his, soul, his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon men who had the mark of the beast, those who worship his image. So on the one hand, Look, look, look at the connection. Both are spoken of in reference to the mark of the beast. There are those who did not receive the mark of the beast, did not receive the mindset of the seventh, the sixth day. They remained ensconced in the economy of the divine and continued to walk with God. And their end is this glorious manifestation of transparency as glass and fire, like as often is used to describe the Holy Spirit. And they have the harps of God singing the song of the Lamb. This is the fruit of the earth reaped for the for the vineyard, from the vineyards of God and collected up for the pleasure of God. Glorious, resplendent, magnificent, perfect. Now that the emphasis is on, in chapter 16, on those who receive the mark of the beast, it's an obvious and clear juxtaposition to show the debauchery, the corruption, the marring, the stench, the unattractiveness, unattractiveness of this company. There's foul and loathsome as the saints are glorious and resplendent. That's the juxtaposition. And you'll see a series of juxtapositions like this going forward. And over in the 17th chapter, there'll be the juxtaposition of the harlot to the bride, and in the 21st chapter, you will see the bride revealed in glory. So, because this is the end of all things, this is the summation of that which was originated from heaven and born out of the mind of God executed upon the earth in the perfection of God's intention and now revealed, and the, the counterpart or the counterpoint, that which was horrific, being born out of a lie, born in the shame of deception and entrapment and grew up in the environment of, con of the continuing form of deception and pretense, pretending to be what it was not, and finally being revealed for what it is. So obviously that is going to be revealed in stench, it's going to be revealed in corruption, revealed in death with language like 
foul and loathsome. Yeah. That's the end, the one and the other. Those who walk with God, those who oppose God. Those who agreed with Satan in his deception and are fully captured by it, when they are revealed, there is no glory in which they may be revealed. And that's the point. Foul and loathsome stench, like, like a running saw. So it's an analogy. It's an, <clears throat> rather than the glorified bodies, rather than the glorifying bodies, it's about the putrefying bodies, like running open sores that stink, that stink like dead men, for that indeed is what they have become, dead while they're still alive, longing for death even, and it not coming. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and the sea became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Here again, the, the blood of a dead man is, uh, is coagulated blood. It's, um, it becomes viscous and uh, dense, indications that the life has gone out of it. The scriptures speak of the life of the flesh being in the blood, and that a living being, the blood in the living person would be a tide like the ocean in full and fluid motion. But death is the picture, and destruction that kills everything that is alive. The sea ceases to be what the sea was supposed to be. But on a different level, it's also speaking of the sea of humanity, all of whom are dead dead in their trespasses and sin, bound over for judgment, and no life is in it, nor can it give life. It's really the outpouring condition of the beast, what life in the beast has come to be, the walking dead. Perhaps this is why uh, movie makers and television show makers seem obsessed these days with presenting pictures of moving movies and pictures of the living dead, a ghastly, lifeless, uh, moving form. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water and they became blood. Rivers and springs of water, unlike the sea, is usually a reference to revelation and insight. And uh, we'll pick up there when we come back. I'm Sam Solon, and I'll see you then. Bye-bye.